Um, I'm delighted that uh, one you're all here, but also that Matt, Matt Ridley has been able to fit in this breakfast um, into his schedule in Australia. It's a short visit, and in theory he's going to Perth at lunchtime today, but we still don't know for sure, uh, courtesy of the uh, volcano in Chile. Um, I, was, I think we're all learning a bit more about how the where the winds blow and, and, and all that at the moment, because I thought it was close to going that way, but it actually came the other way. So <laughs> anyway, um, it's also good to have someone uh, like Matt here. Um, with what seems a never-ending list of things to be gloomy about, uh, it's more than f refreshing to hear from someone who has always seems to have a glass half full view of the world, something that's in the spirit of uh, everyone here at CIS. Even this gloomy weather, though it's looking to less gloomy now, uh, is best interpreted as, interpreted as the drought is over. So uh, um, that's, that's the way we should look at things like this. Uh, Matt received his BA and DPhil at Oxford, uh, researching the evolution of behaviour. He has been a science editor, Washington correspondent, and American editor of The Economist. Um, Adam over here, of course, wrote for The Economist as well. He has a regular column in the Daily Telegraph and it pops up in the Wall Street Journal and various other places. Along with his most recent book, the subject of our discussion this morning, The Rational Optimist, now it will be available outside. You can see it out there, and Matt is happy to sign the books for you. Uh, uh, I think it's 2750 or thereabouts. Matt's also the author of The Red Queen, The Origins of Virtue and, and Genome, and is currently the chairman of international, the International Centre for Life. So thank you very much, Matt. Thanks, Greg, very much indeed. Um, uh, I have actually got a half full glass on the paperback cover of my UK edition, but, but there was a slightly ominous moment last night on the, the uh, stage at the Sydney Opera House when I walked backwards and the half full glass on the, on the chair behind me fell and crashed. So uh, <laughs> maybe there's something I need to learn there. Um, Woody Allen once said that mankind stands at a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness the other to total extinction. <laughs> Let us pray we have the wisdom to make the right choice. And I think he was, you know, satirizing the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the way that really the grown-ups told me when I was a teenager in the 70s that the world was. They told me the population explosion was unstoppable, famine was inevitable, the Ebola virus and swine flu were going to wipe us out, the cancer epidemic uh, caused by pesticides in the environment was going to shorten our lives, the desert was advancing, the oil was running out, economic growth was ceasing, communism was winning, the acid rain was destroying the forests, my sperm counts would fall, and the nuclear winter would finish me off. And uh, you know, and I woke up a couple of decades later and realized it hadn't been like that. And uh, pretty well every one of these predictions had been not only just exaggerated, but 180 degrees wrong. Um, the air was cleaner, the rivers were cleaner, um, uh, the world was much, much better off. Uh, income in my lifetime global, globally has trebled in real terms. Um, lifespan is up by one third. We're gaining lifespan at the rate of about five hours a day worldwide. Child mortality is down by two-thirds since I was born. That's an incredible achievement, really, when you think that that's the greatest measure of misery you can, you can come up with. Uh, poverty has halved, uh, and the population growth rate has halved, too. You know, we were worried about the population explosion. Actually, it's slowing down pretty dramatically. We're heading for a levelling out somewhere north of 9 billion in the second half of this century. Um, and not only that, when, you know, I, when I started writing this book, I, was, I thought, well, fine, you know, I can make some... Uh, points about people being better off, but uh, I'm going to have to concede a few things. People are less happy, they're more miserable, there's all sorts of, you know, da -da. but, you know, look at the statistics, it isn't true. We're, we're not only uh, healthier um, and wealthier, we're also happier, cleverer, freer, kinder, more equal. Um, all of those, you know, more equal, for example, most people think inequality is on the rise. It is within the UK and within the US and some, I don't know about Australia, but um, uh, th there is uh, income inequality increasing, but globally income inequality is collapsing because poor countries are getting rich faster than, than rich countries. So there's a bit of a paradox. Um, the pessimists are telling us we're running into the buffers, we're running out of resources, it's all catastrophe. Uh, and yet the biggest population increase in human history has co coincided with the biggest burst of human prosperity. And to an ex-biologist like me, this is indeed puzzling. You know, you put rabbits um, on an island and give them um, 
uh, and double their numbers, you don't expect their um, lifestyle to improve. You expect them to, to suffer. So how come we thrive when there are more of us? That was kind of the question I posed, you know, coming from a biological angle when I started writing this book. And my short answer, which won't be news to any of you because you've got there long before me, but is that we work for each other, that essentially the definition of um, poverty is self-sufficiency, if you know subsistence, we call it. If you have to supply all your own needs when you get up in the morning, uh, you know, if you want some light in the evening, you've got to kill a sheep and get the fat out and make a candle and da da da. You know, it takes a long time. Whereas if you work for each other through technology, particularly, but through exchange and specialization, uh, then you can cut the amount of time that it takes to um, uh, to to fulfill your needs. And, and my favorite example of this, and this is why I'm thrilled to have a CIS tie on, uh, is um, the, the light bulb. Um, uh, because using some work of William Nordhaus, I was able to work out that uh, if you want to read a book uh, this evening by the light of an 18-watt compact fluorescent bulb, and you're on the average American wage, but it's probably similar for an Australian wage, um, uh, you, how long do you have to work to earn that light? Um, uh, and the answer is about half a second. Um, back in 1950, with a not a compact fluorescent bulb, but an incandescent bulb, and the then average wage and the then cost of electricity, you'd have had to work for eight seconds. That's seven and a half seconds of economic growth. That's seven and a half seconds you can spend fulfilling a different need that you didn't want to fulfill before. Or you can leave the lights on if you're like my kids. Um, <laughs> And back in 1950, it would have taken you 15 minutes to, to earn that much. Uh, uh, sorry, back in, in 1880, it would have taken you 15 minutes to earn that much light uh, from a kerosene lamp. And in 1800, on the average wage, it would have taken you six hours to earn that much light from a tallow candle. The average person could not afford a tallow candle. They, they ate by firelight if they had artificial light at all in those days. And that's just a, a measure of... of of, of where this improvement comes from uh, through technology and, and exchange and specialization. The, the story of humanity is that the more we um, specialize as producers, the more we narrow down what we call our job, um, the more we can diversify as consumers. Um, uh, and the more we exchange things, the more we specialize and vice versa. Um, so, um, you know, in the old days, you could be rich by having people work for you quite literally. Louis XIV had 498 people to prepare his dinner every night, apparently. Um, but then each of you has 498 people to prepare your dinner tonight. Uh, they're working in cafes and bistros and, and restaurants and shops, but at an hour's notice, they'll produce an extremely good meal, judging by the food I've had in Australia this week, um, uh, uh, with much less chance of it having salmonella or E. coli in it than Louis XIV had. Um, and as a biologist, I then went back and said, well, what about other animals? Don't, you know, some other animals work for each other. What about ants, for example? You know, in, in, within an ant colony, the, the workers work for the queen and the queen works for the workers. You know, there's a division of labor there, too. But it remains confined to the family. It's all within the kin network, because that's what a colony is. It's basically a, a large family of ants. Um, uh, so they never work for strangers. And what we managed to do is work for strangers. Um, the difference comes about because they have a division of labor with respect to reproduction, which we don't. Um, they delegate reproduction to a specialized class, the queen. Um, that's something we don't do. Um, uh, we rather like to do our reproducing for ourselves. Uh, not even in Australia do you expect the queen to do it for you. Um, <laughs> and, and then it dawned on me that um, technology is really a... Uh, a, a sort of confection of ideas that w what's key about technology is, is that we accumulate it with, within, within that it embodies our knowledge as it were that, that you know a, s a simple object like this embodies all sorts of ideas that occurred to different people in different times and different places the idea of plastic the idea of metal the idea of writing you know uh, whoever invented these is probably long dead all these different concepts but we've we've brought them together we've accumulated them um, uh, and you know, going back to biology again, my body's a confection of ideas too, genetic ideas. You know, the idea of skin cells, the idea of brain cells, all these kind of different things. Um, uh, and how did evolution do accumulation in this way? How do you accumulate mutations? And the answer is sex. Uh, if you don't have 
sex in evolution, you can't draw upon the genetic inventiveness of the whole species. You can only draw upon the genetic inventiveness of your immediate lineage, your mother's 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 mother. Uh, so the invention of sex enabled evolution to become cumulative, to accumulate different genetic mutations. Uh, and I'm arguing that the invention of exchange sometime in human history played exactly the same role in cultural evolution that the invention of sex had uh, in, uh, in biological evolution. Uh, that in effect what happened is that um, by exchanging we were suddenly able to draw upon uh, the inventive power of, of, of everybody we were interacting with rather than just our immediate neighbors, um, uh, as it were. So when did this start? And I then went off and started talking to archaeologists and trying to work out when um, when exchange began uh, and came back with the answer that there's something interesting happens around 120,000 years ago in human history which is that for the first time you start to see objects moving long distances from where they were um, uh, originated so a prime example of this is shell beads beads used uh, beads made from shells marine snails uh, and these snails live in the Mediterranean but you're finding these things 100 125 miles inland in Algeria um, and if you look at modern Australian Aborigines, you can see that objects moving long distances in the recent past, in the last 100 years, like stone axes from a place called Mount Isa in, in the Northern Territories, um, uh, that, th that is a sign of trade, not migration. It means that people are passing things hand to hand. So, and Neanderthals never did this, um, nor did Homo erectus before. So there's something, that at some point around then, we started this habit of swapping one thing from another, which is so crucial to human beings. And it led to this, um, uh, this exchange and specialization habit, which resulted in, effectively, collective intelligence. Um, the idea that the knowledge we rely on to run society is dispersed. It's not held inside our individual brains. And actually, this is why you know, I'm not interested in arguments about IQ, whether one racial group has higher IQ than another. I don't think that counts. What counts is how well we communicate. 100 uh, stupid people in a room who are talking to each other can achieve far more than 100 clever people who are not talking to each other, as it were. Um, uh, and, and so, of course, I mean, all I'm doing here is rediscovering rather laboriously with a little bit of biology thrown in uh, what Adam Smith said and what Friedrich Hayek particularly said about uh, about dispersed knowledge and 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 uh, and and for me the most almost the most brilliant little essay on this that I read was the one by Leonard Reed um, called I pencil which I'm sure some of you know written in the 1950s where he, he a pencil goes around the world trying to discover how he how he came into existence and concluded concludes at the end that although a million people contributed to his um, uh, manufacture including people who felled trees to make the wood and who mined graphite in Sri Lanka to help provide the um, the lead in the pencil um, not one of them knew how to make a pencil literally nobody in that group knows how to make a pencil the knowledge doesn't exist inside an individual brain. It's in the cloud. Um, and the hu so, so the, the key human invention, the thing that enables us to be prosperous, is this dispersal of knowledge into the cloud um, through technology, which makes it so much more exciting that we now have invented the cloud itself, as it were, in the, the iCloud or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, that, that we are now linking up people so that their ideas can meet and mate um, uh, uh, much more rapidly than they did before through the internet. And that leads me to conclude that while a lot of things are going to go horribly wrong in this century, I'm sure, and Nick's just been depressing me a little bit with some uh, um, worries about uh, the um, uh, sovereign debt crises and banking crises still to come, quite rightly. Um, uh, you know, and we've got war in Libya and earthquakes in uh, New Zealand and Japan and continuing malnutrition and poverty in Africa and you know there will be disasters in this century nonetheless I find it very hard to believe that we won't see an acceleration of the innovation rate in the 21st century and therefore we could be heading for really ludicrously high um, uh, 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 income levels in, in, in the world by the end of the, the 20th, 21st century, which will enable us to do extraordinary things like ecological restoration. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm mildly convinced I will see the mammoth reborn in my lifetime. I'll see um, um, 
national parks uh, enlarged and so on. Um, so um, there you go. That's why I'm a ludicrous optimist, um, but I think a rational one. Um, and uh, uh, I'm interested in hearing from. Yeah, I should end by saying. Um, this is quite a hard sell, this book, in Britain and Europe at the moment. Um, <laughs> and it's not a very easy sell in California, actually. Which, you know, when I was writing this, I thought, well, at least I'll get an easy, easy audience in California. But, of course, they're all frightfully gloomy, or at least they were last year when I, when I was spending a lot of time there. Um, but I think you guys have quite a lot to be cheerful about, so I'm rather hoping that uh, you're on my side. Thank you very much. Okay, over to you, please. Cass. Now, you better tell me about your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I wrote a book, uh, which I have to say I admitted to Greg, drew heavy inspiration from um, from your Origins of Virtue, which I just got to say, if you haven't already read it, is about the best book ever. I'm sure the new one is excellent, but that one is fantastic. Thank you very um, much. And, and I, I think it's fantastic that you are giving dignity to optimism because people get so upset by it. If you try to tell them things are good, they think you're either complicit in the little that is bad <laughs> Yes. or thick and I think yes. um, uh, the thing that we haven't cracked is <laughs> why, <laughs> why do people feel there's such a moral imperative to judge the world as bad in spite of all this evidence? I really don't know the answer to this. You're absolutely right. And uh, just Two days ago I was doing a long interview with Radio New Zealand and, and the indignation of the presenter at my view um, you know, was was really striking. You know, there, there was something evil about what I was saying, and and I just don't quite follow it. Um, uh, I mean, I often get accused of complacency, and my response is, hang on a minute. I think the complacent view is the one that says um, today's technology is good enough, today's wealth is good enough. You know, uh, we should be use the precautionary principle, not invent anything. You know, um, how dare you suggest it could get better? I think the the opposite of complacency is to say, today's world's better than it was, but it's a veil of tears compared with what we could achieve if we really put our shoulders to the wheel. Um, and so, uh, so I, I reject the charge of complacency. Um, the, there's a there's a rather nice remark by John Stuart Mill that uh, uh, the man who um, hopes, the man who despairs when others hope, is regarded by a large class of persons as a sage. Um, and it's just always sounded wiser to be Cassandra. You know, Pollyanna is a fool. Cassandra is a respected lady. And <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> so, I, did, uh, I didn't realise Cass was short for Cassandra. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Sorry. Um, so, uh, but I don't. You know, th these are not satisfactory answers. I don't know why. Um, Roger. Yes. Thoroughly. In I thoroughly enjoyed reading Genome. Thank you very Thank much. You. A fantastic read. And so I just want to pursue this theme because for a biologist, you must have thought about the, um, the reasons for us being so happily pessimistic. Yeah. Um, I, 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 it, the, um, the, the, the evolutionary psychology explanation of, of human pessimism uh, is in a way pretty obvious, isn't it? That uh, you and I are in the Stone Age in Africa, we're walking towards the water hole. You say, hang on, I don't like the look of this. I think there might be a lion behind that bush. And I say, no, no, it'll all be fine. And I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm dead. You're alive. You've got my girl. You know, your, your, your genes are in the next generation and mine are not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, pessimism spreads um, by natural selection. Uh, I think I believe that. Oh, it's a, bit, I mean, it's a just so story. Um, but another point is that. Um, the, the psychology of uh, worrying about the future kind of makes sense in that the past turned out okay. Turned out okay for you and me, we're both here, you know. Um, whatever happened, whatever went wrong in your life and mine, um, we overcame it. That might not be true tomorrow. Um, and so there's something sensible actually about being much more worried about the future than you are um, content about the past and that sort of explains nostalgia uh, not really but it's a it's a thought come uh, if you've got any comeback i'd be interested Just, isn't this um 
part of the cloud phenomenon that it might be um, okay for us as a whole, but it mightn't be okay for me personally. Yes. That, of course, is a very good point, and that actually comes back to Cass's point, that uh, that in some sense by saying, um, uh, well, I was, on a, I was on a radio program and, and I did my thing about, you know, for a person on the average wage, the cost of a hamburger is tenth, one-tenth of what it was in terms of time worked than it was 50 years ago. And, and the guy came back and he said, well, that's for the average, but what about a person at the bottom, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's better for him too. But, <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, and I think this does come back to Cass's point that that that, that if you're um, if y if you say the average is okay, it sounds like you're not showing sufficient um, uh, uh, compassion towards the people who who uh, are, are not at the average. Um, and but yes, the. Um, and yeah, and so we go straight into the arguments like, uh, well, it's all very well saying that free trade will increase general employment, but that's not much comfort to the guy who's lost his job because of foreign competition. Just a quick question. I spent the last few weeks in Germany, and it never occurred to me what a miserable, pessimistic bunch of people they were. <laughs> Especially then returning to Australia, and um, I mean this is just anecdotal um, uh, evidence, but I wonder whether it's got anything to do with the fact that basically everybody in Australia who is here today has migrated, or his parents or grandparents has migrated, and I would like you to comment on that a bit. Um, is it true that migrant nations are generally, for genetic reasons perhaps even, more optimistic than other nations? This is a fascinating one, and uh, Oliver, you're right, it's, it's, it's something that I've... I, I give them thought to you know the people with the get up and go got up and went, uh, <laughs> and the people who sat around saying oh, there's no point in getting on a boat. Um, but then hang on, some of you didn't come here of your own accord, did you? I suspect it's only a small part. Of it. Well, actually, no. There, there is. A, I mentioned it in, in in my book. I've, I've nearly forgotten about this. But Anna Draper at, at, at Harvard has actually done a, uh, a a global map of of a risk taking allele uh, on the, one of the dopamine genes, uh, and its its frequency does increase with the distance of migration. You know that you get to Australia, you get to South America. You know, I'm talking. A, previous migration in that case, but uh, you, you can see that the, the more risk-taking allele just gets a little bit commoner. Just one follow-up on that, but if that's true for previous migration waves, um, is that still true for today's migration waves where migrants do not travel because they're particularly entrepreneurial, but because they seek the safety of a welfare state somewhere far away? Yeah. Um, but I think you know, if you cross the Sahara and get on a boat to Lampedusa and, you know, nearly drown, still a certain amount of enterprise <laughs> required. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I, yeah, I suspect. Anyway, I don't. Know. Just on Germany, um, I do think that it's. Sorry, and I'm not going to diss G Germany, but um, well, a little bit. Um, uh, the the the. Uh, 35 people have died now of this E. coli outbreak. There is no question that food irradiation is a technology that probably could have, I read this in the Wall Street Journal last week, but it could have prevented that. It's a perfectly good technology for, for sterilizing food. Um, uh, the reason it is not used in the European Union is because Germany vetoed it in 2000. Well, everything nuclear in Germany is bad, as you know. Yes, of course. How are you going to keep the lights on in Germany? Yeah, because we're getting the uh, French nuclear power now. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Matt, you talked about how pessimistic it is in the United Kingdom at the minute, and yet there's so much talk about happiness. I wonder if you could elucidate this sort of emergence of this happiness industry that we're seeing under David Cameron, and I think the Office of National Statistics has recently been surveying Britons about how happy they are. Why are we now looking at different measurements? We're, we're moving away from gross domestic product to gross happiness product, or whatever they want to call it. 
short answer because we're not very good at getting the GDP figures up. <laughs> so we've got to look for something else um, to distract ourselves. Um, longer answer because a bunch of academics like Richard Layard have, have sort of been influencing civil servants and things like that and, and uh, you know, the sort of um, uh, growth doesn't necessarily make you happier a lot. Have, have that, that sort of generation of academics have had quite a big influence, I think. And everybody thinks Bhutan has it right because, uh, you know, they went, went for this. But, uh, you know, the idea of someone knocking on my door and saying, I'm here from the government, I'm here to make your general well-being better, uh, you know, make you happier. Uh, but, but, but isn't it important, you know, according to your thesis, we're exchanging, we're exchanging goods and services, we're exchanging ideas, and we're measuring all of that. We can see that the world's getting better. I mean, your book lays out all the statistics. If we move away from that measurement of growth, however you want to count it, whether it's, you know, um, you know how long we're living or, or uh, the wages, whatever, we're moving away from all of those as measurements. What, what does that mean for us long term if, if we keep going down this path of measuring such an ephem ephemeral notion? Well, I think the, the, the scary thing is how easy it is to fake the measurement of, of this thing. In other words, uh, uh, you know, you, you, how you measure general well-being is so uh, um, woolly, as I think you're saying, that, um, that, that um, you know, the civil servants can sort of cook it up to make it look like they've achieved something, over f or the politicians, I should say, uh, over five years or whatever it might be. So uh, I, I am, uh, as you can tell, a little bit sceptical uh, about all this. Um, uh, the, there's Greg uh, Easterbrook wrote a wonderful thing about this happiness industry when he said, um, uh, you know, every time he sits down to eat a meal, he says a silent prayer. He doesn't, I'm sure, but you know, not every time. But um, um, thank you, Lord, for the fact that I am um, content, uh, well-fed, comfortable. Uh, and well dressed and still unhappy because I could be hungry, <laughs> miserable, cold, and still unhappy. Okay, uh, that's the cue for you, Rob. I'd like to ask a question about mood and progress. Um, your opening comments were that people didn't think things would get better, and they have. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, is you have to be optimistic for things to get better. Is there, in fact, in human history, have there been periods of optimism and pessimism? And it possibly, it, it just could be that whatever you are, the opposite will happen. That is, the 19th century yeah. had great dreams of, uh, of, yeah. of you know, and then 20th century, a terrible shock. Uh, you know, that, that yeah. there were great, terrible wars. People thought it would never happen in Europe, and look, look at what happened. And then, I'm just wondering, if, if you've thought about mm. the historical link, even back in the ancient world, before people thought of progress, when the, when the, when the old was better, mm -hmm. and yet um, there was remarkable progress in its own way. I, I, it's an historical question, I guess, rather than a biological one. It's a lovely answer. question, and, and, and it's an interesting thought. Uh, to some extent, I used to think, you know, that the, the, 18th century, the 19th century was full of um, progressive ideals and optimism, and the then the 20th century we invented pessimism. And when I went back and looked, I found actually that, you know, the bestseller in 1890 was, um, Oh, uh, what's that guy with a uh, German name? Spengler. Uh, no, it was before Spengler, but yeah, exactly. Spengler in the 1920s. Or in, uh, or in memoriam by um, uh, Tennyson, this terribly dark poem at the exactly. time of Britain's greatest growth. And so my favourite quotation is, is from uh, um, Thomas Babington Macaulay in 1830 saying, why is it that with so much improvement behind us we are told to expect only deterioration before us? And that was in 1830. It hardly started the improvement <laughs> compared with today. So uh, I'm, I'm, I sort of think the intelligentsia has always been pessimistic. Um, uh, and the, there's been no great change in that. It's just that there's more of the intelligentsia around now, so you sort of hear it, hear it more. Um, um, but also, another point, pe people often say to me, well, yeah, but isn't it necessary to be pessimistic in order to confront our problems and solve them? Um, and superficially, that sounds reasonable. But then you go back and you say, Steve Jobs, is he driven by worry about the world? You know, Thomas Edison, George Stevenson, uh, Archimedes, you know, every single one of these guys, um, uh, Al Khwarizmi in, in Arabia, Fibonacci in, in Renaissance Italy, you know, inventing things, were they driven, were, were they, they were each of them living in the richest place on earth at the time, in the most 
expansive and optimistic spot, and, and they were driven by ambition, not not worry. So, you know, if, if necessity was the mother of invention, then the Zimbabwean software industry would be rather better off than it is. <laughs> Ross Parrish, uh, a person who was very heavily involved in the formation of this, uh, found out uh, found a saying somewhere: pessimism is almost as good as optimism once you get used to it. <laughs> but uh, nice. my my question is: um, uh, civilizations have collapsed in the past, um, and I guess our civilization could collapse while others went on. Is there something in the uh, bureaucratic process? How good is the bureaucratic process at uh, this business of developing a cloud of information and uh, so on? And could that be the reason that civilizations collapse, that the bureaucracy uh, uh, becomes uh, dominant? Yeah, I, I, when, when I'm asked what are the two things I am pessimistic about as far as the future of human, or what are, what are the things, I, I, give, I say two words, which is, bureaucracy and superstition. Uh, in other words, if you look back at what went wrong in the Arabian Renaissance in, 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 you know, in the 1100s, it's that they started burning books and going mystical. If you look back at what went wrong in Ming China in 1300, it's that um, the Ming emperors started controlling what every merchant, you know, you, you had to send the emperor a list of your inventory every month uh, if you were a merchant after a while. You know, the, the bureaucracy just came down like a dead weight onto onto society and the result was immiserization um, so yeah I think it's it, it certainly has been possible in the past to kill a civilization by mm. in, you know Diocletian in the Roman Empire you know he was a terrific red tape guy uh, and everyone says he was a great emperor I don't think so at all I think he was you know he was the sort of European Union of the day um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so so yes, it is. It is certainly possible to kill a civilization by by over government, as it were. You know, we know North Korea is a good example. Um, uh, could you do that globally? I mean, so far we've been lucky because there's always been somewhere that's kept the torch alive. And, and, and in my book, I describe a rather poignant moment in the 12th century when, you know, Arabia's turned in on itself. China's not being very um, outward looking. Uh, uh, the you know, luckily there's a few city-states in Italy and they're trading with a few city-states in North Africa and that kind of keeps the flame alive and you wonder if that hadn't happened. Yeah, Paris also, you know, you've got the crushing of the, um, uh, what was it called, the, the medieval renaissance. Um, you know, so it, 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 sometimes it's by the skin of our teeth that we've kept this flame burning. And if we now have a very globalised world, is it possible that the whole world could turn its back on growth and innovation and experimentation and exchange um, and you know, God, I'm going to turn into a pessimist if I go on like this, <laughs> aren't I? Uh, thank you. It's a similar sort of issue really that I'd like to raise. You obviously give a lot of importance to innovation as a source of improvement uh, but there's an argument around innovation is slowing down perhaps because society is becoming more risk averse and discouraging innovation. Um, is that uh, something that even you think we should worry about? Yeah, I'm quite intrigued by Tyler Cowen's argument in, in The Great Stagnation, which is his new book, that, you know, that we're running out of um, uh, sources of, it, of innovation. Um, uh, and, and particularly a, a sort of gloss on his argument that, that Don Boudreau wrote, which, which I found very persuasive, which is that it's the sort of low-hanging fruit point, that uh, it's easy to do innovation in agriculture is easy to do innovation in manufacturing when you get to services some of them it's easy to do innovation in but you know by the time you get to sort of health care and so on you know that the, the, we're left with the high hanging fruit the, the, the sectors in which it's quite difficult to do innovation in there might be something in that argument but I don't think so I, I'm, I'm, I'm always struck by how um, if you go back to the 1950s and look at where they expect innovation to happen in the future then they expect it to be in transport. Uh, they expect us to have personal jetpacks and gyrocopters and uh, you know routine space travel by the 2000s. In fact, transport 
hits the buffers really in terms of technical improvements. Sure, there's a lot, you know, there are catalytic converters and budget airlines and things like that, but there's not that you, you, you hit diminishing returns in terms of the speed and and uh, fuel efficiency and things like that to some extent over the next few decades. Whereas communication, which they didn't write about at all in the 1950s, they thought the telex was the height of human achievement. Um, goes berserk and you get Moore's law and you get all this kind of thing so um, at some point communication runs out of room to keep improving what's next well I think it's got to be in biotechnology and healthcare where you're seeing extraordinary uh, improvements in technology which don't necessarily make things cheaper at the moment but I suspect they will I suspect cancer treatments not only going to get better it's going to get cheaper at some point uh, you know, when uh, regenerative medicine has the promise potentially stem cells of being quite a cheap technology once it's perfected. Uh, and that would then make a big difference. So I think the torch will pass between sectors, but I think innovation will continue. There's one much more general counter argument to that, which is that we're all getting older. Um, and young people do a lot of the innovating. Uh, and, um, you know, once the population growth rate really has slowed down, globally um, uh, or, or you know gone to zero uh, and countries look like Japan or Italy in terms of their demographic profiles can you really imagine that much innovation happening in these uh, um, social security dominated societies it, 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 it's it's an issue of your optimism about about the cloud um, you know, I mean, I think I think there was a there was a point where we all felt that the internet was going to be this great, you know, meeting and mating of ideas, as you said. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, it's becoming apparent that it's 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 not one community. It's mm -hmm. it's a series of, of gated communities, everyone existing in its own little parallel universe, where you know some quite sort of illiberal and unhelpful ideas sort of flourish. Does that concern you at all? Yes, it does actually. And and again, this is. You know, you write a book and then you start the conversation. And th this was sort of a cloud the man size of a man. Well, cloud is the wrong word, but the, the, you know, it was a, it was a threat the size of a uh, a pinhead to start with. But uh, I'm more concerned about it now. Um, uh, the, uh, not only governments wanting to interfere in, in in this, but also the sort of illiberality of of some of the approaches people have to to running their own. Um, walled gardens or whatever you call them within the internet um, uh, it's not something I understand fully um, yet uh, and uh, you know whether Facebook really is a sort of um, a nationalization a, a balkanization of the internet uh, and Facebook and, and things like it um, I, I, I don't really know but I, yeah I think it is a worry yeah John Scott Uh, I'd like to put to you that basically your views really uh, contain within themselves a kind of paradox which delivers the answer to why all these things are happening and goes back to the very first question. After all, the more reasons we have to be optimistic, and you've quite rightly spelled out all the reasons why we do have those uh, to be optimistic, the more our so-called intellectual leaders are going to carve out a kind of place for themselves in the pantheon of intellectualism by being pessimistic. You don't get any, any don't get any special place in the world by agreeing with everybody with being optimistic. So you have people like Noam Chomsky and uh, John Pilger and uh, Robert Mann, to like a lo local uh, example, uh, making a name for themselves by being pessimistic. Now, so in a way, it seems to me that the more reasons, the more the world ha uh, goes on getting better, the more we're going to be afflicted with people like, I don't know, uh, 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 climate change, uh, uh, alarmists and people like this, yeah. because that's what, that's how you get a name for yourself. After all, some of them, to take that example, the climate change people, some of them, the very same people were talking about the Ice Age 40 years ago. Yeah. Now, just, can I ask you a factual question? Uh, and I'd like you to comment on that to general proposition, but I've seen some references recently, and I haven't had time to follow them up, suggesting that the Cameron government has now decided to deny capitation fees to, uh, to UK universities for people signing up for what you might call, call liberal arts, I think. Is that the case? Because that's a very hopeful development. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, don't...
quote me on this, but I think what's happening is that, um, how does it work? Uh, no, no, sorry. I, I, mean, I was thinking that in, that in, it, uh, in some sense, the, the, the new fee structure where you pay more fees I in terms of uh, a, a repayable loan from the government um, uh, to go to university is actually going to benefit the humanities because they're cheaper to teach than the sciences. And in order to redress that, the government may be thinking about stepping in and sort of doing yeah, something to slow that. that. So t yeah, exactly. That, so the the, <laughs> the there may be something about that, but I I haven't heard of it as a specific policy. But it's an interesting question. Um, as to your general point, yeah, I'm afraid it's absolutely true that you know if I sat down and wrote a book next year saying I was all wrong, uh, it's all coming to an end, catastrophe is around the corner, I could make a lot of money. Matt, about a decade ago or so, I read a book uh, called Cooperation, and they talked about, uh, you know, cooperation grows the size of the pie, and you need competition to actually take your share of the pie. And I was just going to ask you to talk a little bit about the importance and the link between uh, competition and cooperation, mm. and how you see that developing. It's a lovely word, that isn't it? I was very jealous when when he coined that, that word cooperation. Um, who wasn't John Clippinger? Was it who? Oh yeah, it was two guys. Yes, I can't remember their name. Anyway, um, yeah, well, um, people say, "Oh, hang on, you're a free market advocate. That means you believe in devil take the hindmost, um, sharp elbowed competition, blah blah blah." And I say, "Well, hang on, I'm talking about collective collaboration through the cloud, in which people um, work for each other instead of working for themselves." I don't really see that as a brutal social Darwinist view of the world. I see it as the opposite. And and uh, this comes back to the origins of virtue, which, which Ka the point Cass made earlier. Um, and that, yeah, I think we do kind things to each other, sometimes because we're just feeling kind, and sometimes because it's enlightened self-interest. Uh, and as Adam Smith pointed out 250 years ago, if we rely on just the kind things, we'll not, you know, just the kind motives, we probably won't get very far. But if we harness the self-interested kind of kindness as well, we can make a much more uh, cooperative and benefit uh, beneficial society. So uh, I do think that it would be lovely to get our friends in the humanities to, to understand that um, uh, businessmen are unbelievably sort of I mean, they spend most of the time not offending each other, being nice to each other, thinking how they can cooperate, thinking how they can be nice to their customers. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, you know, th that, that kind of thing comes as a shock to your average Guardian reader in the UK. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, it, it, I am hoping to try and turn that argument on its head with all this talk of, of collaboration and cooperation and, and the cloud occurring through uh, exchange. Thank you, John Graham. Uh, as a medical practitioner, I often came across people who, despite diabolical diseases, were happy, uh, and others with minimal problems were not. And uh, I would often say, you realise this isn't a dress rehearsal, I mean, looking at our mortality. Uh, and uh, the minute you talk about mortality, it brings you back to religious faith and religious fervour and so on. And uh, my observation on religious fervor is that sometimes it breeds pessimism, sometimes it breeds optimism. That's in the individual. In the global sense, have you noted over the periods of time that religious fervor has actually persuaded the world generally to be optimistic or to be pessimistic? It's a really good question and a very nice observations. Thank you for that. And and. Uh, I, it's not something I've made a special study of, the, the history of religion versus the history of, of, of optimism. So it's an interesting question. I'd like to go back and, and, and look at it more closely. Um, but my general instinct here is that uh, if you look at the sort of millenarian uh, millennialism that, that religion quite often spawns and the, and the, the end of the world cult and, and stuff, uh, I, I'd be hard pressed to start off with a 
prejudice that, that religion does uh, encourage um, uh, optimism um, generally, you know, net. Um, but I think American data does tend to show that there is a slight tendency to be a little more um, sanguine about the world if you are religious um, than, than if you're not. Um, so it, maybe it does help, I don't know. Yeah, to do with the precautionary principle. How the hell do you deal with people who bring this up all the time? And you must get it all the time. How do you deal with them? Yeah. Well, I think my answer to the precautionary principle is that um, it's uh, it, it, that it it falsifies itself. Uh, in other words, it, it, the precautionary principle fails the precautionary principle um, because what it does is it tells you uh, we better not invent a new technology like food irradiation in case it does harm um, but what about uh, the harm done by not inventing it uh, and that seems to me to be the the the, um, uh, the 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 problem with the precautionary principle is talking about um, one side of the equation and not the other it it, it it sort of automatically holds future technologies to a higher standard than uh, existing Technologies. A good example is is that um, uh, in Europe, genetically modified food has to be traceable from farm to fork through a bureaucratic system. Um, uh, organic food doesn't have to be. We've just seen the consequence of that. It took them about three weeks to work out where these bean sprouts had come from that were killing people, etc. So, so uh, um, uh, I, uh, you know, of course one should be cautious about. You know, one should be, one should ask hard questions about any innovation. You know, does it does it have major risks? But to do so in the in the vacuum of not considering the risks of not adopting and uh, uh, the, the risks of existing technologies um, seems to me the problem with the precautionary principle. Um, I try that argument. I'm not sure I always win the argument. So uh, if you've got any better ideas, I'd be well. I'd be um, keen to hear them. <laughs>